Good evening. My name is Michael Anthony De Miranda, and I serve as the Dean of the School of Education and Human Development at Texas A&M University. It is an honor and a privilege to welcome you to our dialogues in transforming education. Here in the Zone Club, live from Kyle Field on the campus of Texas A&M University. I'd like to also extend a very warm Aggie welcome to those joining us, not only here in person, but the many who are tuning in via our live stream. I wanna thank you for taking part in this special evening. For more than 50 years, our school has been committed to preparing the educators and administrative leaders of tomorrow, both here in Texas and around the United States. As part of our commitment, we want to lead the conversation in a crucial topic for students, parents, teachers, and administrators everywhere. And that topic is the professional preparation of teachers. This evening, we are proud to bring two longtime leaders on the subject together on stage. By, by what I mean by long time is I mean a combined experience of nearly a century of leadership and, and scholarship. Marilyn has seven each celebrating their 30th birthday this year. Am I close to redeeming myself? Okay. We are so proud that both are members of the National Academy of Education and represent our field in an exemplary manner. They will share their perspectives on navigating K-12 education in our one hour conversation. Afterwards, we invite those of you here in attendance to join us for a reception where food and beverage will be served and you can meet our speakers and our moderator. If you are watching us via live stream, you can race over and join us as well. I would like to ask those in attendance to please take out your favorite device and please place it on silent for the duration of this event out of respect for all in attendance this afternoon. So now let's introduce our speakers and our moderator and let's have some fun. First, we have our fellow of the Hagler Institute for Advanced Study at Texas A&M University. Her experience in education spans more than 50 years, including research on educational practices of teachers who are successful with our most underserved students. She is also a former president of the American Education Research Association, also known as AERA. Would you please join me in a warm Aggie welcome for Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings. Next, we have another former AERA president. Seems like that was one of the requisites for invitation, right? In fact, she introduced Gloria as the incoming president of AERA more than 15 years ago. This renowned scholar and practitioner has received national and international recognition for her scholarship regarding teacher education, research, practice, and policy. Please join me in a warm Aggie welcome for Dr. Marilyn Cochran Smith. Marilyn, welcome. Our moderator this evening is a professor and Houston Endowment Endowed Chair in Urban Education for our school's Department of Teaching, Learning, and Culture. 
Her empirical research centers on where teaching and curriculum meet. Her longtime commitment earned her a Lifetime Achievement Award from AERA. She's also served as president, chair, and other leadership roles for various national and international education organizations. Here on the campus of Texas A&M University, she is also the founding director of our Collaborative for Teacher Education. Please join me in a warm Aggie welcome for Dr. Cheryl Craig. Dr. Craig. Dr. Craig, the evening is yours. Thank you, Dr. Dermand, and I'm glad you didn't add my age and experience onto or we might have fallen off the, the, the deck. Um, I'm very happy and honored to be our moderator this evening, and it's it's just just a great honor. And I would like to say that I I've, I've known these two scholars for a very long time. On my immediate right is Marilyn Cochran Smith, and for those doctoral students who are here, I met her in 1990 at a teacher research conference at the University of California Davis before we went to San Francisco for an AERA meeting. And on my far right is, is, is Gloria Ladson Billings. And I met her about the same year and she was at the National Council of Social Studies in Chicago. And I've been following both of their careers and I've been reading up on their work. And one of the things that really strikes me about their work is how interdisciplinary it is how evidenced it is, and how they both cite each other. That's one of the things that you will notice as you read their work. I wanted to add an aside tonight because both of our scholars are stalwart defenders of teachers, teachers' voices, teachers' ability to make decisions. And I wanted to say we have two groups in this audience tonight who've been together for a long time. In the middle group, in the middle of this side of the section, we have people who are from the teacher, uh, the portfolio group that has been together, a group of teacher readers, researchers who've been get together from 1998. And we also have several faculty in this audience and online who are a member of a faculty academy group together since 2002. And they are just exemplary ways of how, what happens when teachers are and faculty are supported. And I think it fits with, with your theme very much. In our audience as well is we have many undergraduate and graduate students from our own Texas A&M University, but beaming in, we have graduate classes from University of St. Thomas in Houston, University of Houston, um, Clear Lake. And we also have some uh, other people uh, from uh, um, the University of Houston downtown as well. There may be other cl uh, classes with us. For example, yesterday when Gloria spoke, we had 10, we had 10 people from uh, Aga Khan University in Pakistan. But we have people online uh, with us as well. But I wanted as well to let you know that we have a large audience out there and just how much we appreciate that audience because the topics we'll be talking about tonight are just not these topics for Texas A&M, for Texas, for the country, but they are international topics. And so if we look at our states, we have eight states that are represented online. They are New York, Ohio, Louisiana, Utah, Arizona, Virginia, and Maryland. And we have 12 countries. They are Canada, Poland, Zambia, Spain, Malaysia, Switzerland, South Africa, Kenya, India, Pakistan, Brazil, and Jamaica. Welcome everyone. We are so delighted to have you with us. We have three topics we're going to be studying tonight and having a great conversation about. And I would like to, um, to begin with the, the questions and uh, to focus on who's going to be speaking. And Dr. Cochran Smith will be the first person. And so I'm turning to you, Marilyn, as a recognized expert in teacher education and the author of Good and Just Teaching and the, the author of the memorable editorial 
many people will know this one, lovers, leavers, stayers, and dreamers. Would you please uh, tell us and kick off our discussion tonight on teacher shortage, retention, and preparation? Thanks, Cheryl. And I want to just say I'm so pleased to be here uh, to be part of this. So thanks to all of you for coming. It's wonderful to work with Cheryl and Gloria. You've already heard that Gloria and I have worked together for a long time. Uh, so this topic of teacher shortages is really an important one. And I think that to open up the topic, we need to think about three things, three questions, really. Do we have a teacher shortage problem? If we do, what kind of problem is it? And the obvious third one is, what can we do about it? Is there something we can do about it? So this question, do we have a teacher shortage problem? Turns out that's not such an easy question. It's complex and it's unclear. Part of the reason is because we don't have data from all states or all areas. States aren't required to collect this kind of information. Not all states are. Also, there's no consensus definition of shortage. So sometimes when people are arguing about whether we have a shortage, they're really using different definitions. It's also complex because teacher shortages always have to do with local labor markets. Teacher labor markets are not national, they're local. So for example, and teachers are not interchangeable. So for example, you might know a really great first grade teacher who's fabulous at getting people to learn to read that person is not available to fill an, an opening for an AP biology teacher. By the same token, an AP biology teacher in Greenwich, Connecticut is probably not available to fill a position for a biology teacher in rural Kansas. So all of this means that teacher shortages are uneven. They vary by geographic location. They vary by subject, by grade level. Uh, and even within a particular state. Even with all of those qualifications about how complex this is, I think the answer to the first question from my perspective is yes, we do have teacher shortages in the United States. And I wanna recommend, if you're open for new reading, uh, Brown University's Annenberg Center 2022 working paper on shortages, Nugent and colleagues. It's, it's really good. It has a lot of information. There's also a, a 2022 ABC News poll, which has data from all states. At least it has some data. So let me give you a few facts. As of August 2022, there were 36,000 vacant teaching positions in this country. And there were 163 teaching positions that were being filled by unqualified people. Now what's unqualified people? In some places that meant National Guard troops were attending classes. In some places it meant people who were certified in one thing were teaching in some other area. And in some places it simply meant that those who had no preparation whatsoever had gotten emergency certification. Um, so those are some facts. Nearly every state this past year had unfilled positions in certain areas, and almost every state reported that they had a shortage or shortages. Some of the most common shortage areas, you probably have heard this many times, include special education, all the STEM areas, bilingual education, and in some places, some areas of secondary education. The most important fact, I think, is that just like with other disparities, teacher shortages hit the hardest on uh, schools that, have, uh, that are in low income areas or that are in areas of high poverty, that have large numbers of minoritized or marginalized students, especially in urban and rural areas. So that's my first answer. Yes, we have teacher shortages. So what kind of a problem is it? 20 years ago, Richard Ingersoll and some others told us we didn't have a supply problem in teaching and teacher education. We had a retention problem. In other words, some of you remember this when this first came out, it was pretty shocking. He made the point that we produced enough teachers, but many of them left, as many as 50% left teaching within five years. Now we have both a supply problem 
and a retention problem. A, a few more facts. So the teacher pipeline has been dwindling in universities over the last 10 years, about as much as 30% just over the last 10 years. In particular, there are low numbers of teacher, teachers of color enrolling in teacher education. 50% um, of the students in public schools in this country are students of color, but 81% of the teachers are white. So that tells us something about the kinds of shortages we have. Teacher candidates of color are leaving teaching at higher rates than white teachers. And some people have said, if the retention levels continue, coupled with the small numbers of people uh, entering teaching, we will have critical teacher shortages for decades to come. So very quickly, what can we do? Um, in the US and in some other countries, but not all, Teaching is not perceived as an attractive career. So I think we have to work on changing how the career is perceived by people. Um, again, there's some really good international research. Elaine Muntha just did a big review of all the literature internationally that's published in English about recruiting, retention, and shortages. Um, I think we have to work on some of the deterrents for people who don't want to enter teaching and aren't even thinking about it because they perceive that the working conditions, the resources, the support, the workload, the pay, and the status of the profession is just not up to par. One really important thing is most of the research suggests people don't leave teaching primarily because of the pay. Pay matters, but that's not the primary reason. People leave teaching because they can't succeed with the students they're working with. They don't feel that they can meet their students' needs. So just one last point, and that is, I think one thing we could do to address this problem would be to decrease the amount of stories we see in the printed media or on social media that bashes teachers. We could stop doing that. And simultaneously, I think we could increase the degree of appreciation and respect and recognition we give to teachers. So that's an opening. Thank you, Marilyn. And one of the things we noticed from uh, COVID, we started to have an upsurge in how we started to think about teachers, but that slipped away pretty quickly. Gloria, would you like to add your... Um, I'd just like to say, I think Marilyn hit all of the really significant points about teacher shortages, the issue of distribution, where do, where do teachers end up? Uh, some things I'd like to underscore is that on the supply side, over the past 20 years, we have made teaching a deterrent at one of the places that produce the most teachers, historically Black colleges and universities. Now you go to these campuses because of raise standards on one end, um, they can't get into these programs. And then there are backdoor programs. When I, you know, we may get into alternative certification that says anybody with a pulse can come in, right? So we have this. The second thing is why would people who have, you know, particularly first generation people who've worked so hard to get into college and all of their family resources and they're often taking on debt follow a career path that won't benefit them financially. I mean, I, I'm, I've started to ask this question about flagship campuses. If I could go to a little small regional school and still get a state certification, why would I spend all this money to go to A&M or UT or Wisconsin or Penn? Why wouldn't I just go to a small program? And so I don't think we've thought a lot about that supply side. Um, Marilyn's absolutely correct that Ingersoll has been warning us for years about the sort of uh, revolving door of teacher education. Uh, typically, when we are talking about shortages and when we're talking about achievement, we are almost always talking about the top 25 school districts. We're not talking about everybody. So there are places like New Trier in Illinois or uh, Shaker Heights in Ohio who are not having teacher shortages. They're serving uh, well-prepared middle to upper middle income communities and people are very excited to teach in those places. 
Um, in addition to um, the fact that people not wanting to go into the career uh, because not, you know, not about the money, as Marilyn said, but I think there's another um, thing that makes people leave, and that is working conditions. Not, not merely who the students are, but the way I am treated as a, quote, professional, where I am told exactly what to say and exactly what page I'm supposed to be on on a particular day, where there's no opportunity for the sort of pedagogical creativity that we are pushing at the preparation level is just not available to people. So it's like, you know, I could be just making widgets if that's what, what you want me to do. So I think those are other, you know, aspects of why people are leaving the field. And also the fact that, um, that um, our early educators knew that the people who were teachers needed to be in the middle class to model for the students. Um, and this right now we have so many teachers that don't aren't able to put their own children through university while they're struggling to help other children. Mm -hmm. And that creates a, a serious problem. And, and uh, Gloria, as a teacher education expert, the originator of the near universal idea of culturally relevant teaching, and the one who first spoke about educational debt. Uh, could you please lead our conversation about what the university does, needs to do in order to meet the future of teacher education? So I think that the university is probably looking at two very divergent futures. I'm someone who uses a lot of analogies to sort of make sense of the world. So I have two analogies for directions that teacher education could go. One is pessimistic. Uh, the other is a lot more optimistic. We could go in the direction, let me start with the pessimistic one. We could go in the direction of computer programming. When I first became a college educator, if you wanted to know programming, you went over to computer sciences, they had these, these languages, Pascal, Fortran, COBOL, people who remember this know that nobody uses this stuff anymore, right? Uh, so you had to go that route. I have a son and daughter-in-law who are in, who are Silicon Valley workers, both college educated, but say, we work right alongside people who have never been to college. They know how to code and we pay them well. So teacher education could go that route of you don't need it, you know, we'll, 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 we'll make it work, we'll fix it in the workplace. Or the more optimistic view would be we could go the direction of nursing. Nursing, much like teaching, began away from the academy. Nursing began in the church. Florence Nightingale was in the church, right? And little by little, they started having more close affiliation with um, the academy, two-year nursing programs, of which there still exist some, but not a lot. Most nurses have a BSN. And now it seems you need to have a master's degree to really get a great job in nursing. That's the direction we could go in. Unfortunately, we're not we're being told you don't need an affiliation with the academy. Uh, there are movements afoot to say, let's take teaching out of the university, which is where it was before, much like nursing. It was really that you became a teacher just by sort of apprenticing. Um, but if we said closer affiliation with the academy, more research uh, linkages, then we might have the same status. Nursing status has improved greatly over time. So those I think are our two divergent futures. Both of which are associated with feminized professions. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the comments I wanna make build on yours very well, because in thinking about this question, I was thinking about the work that universities need to do to have a future in teacher education. So I think they, they go together well. And the first one is, also goes well with what you said. Teaching is really 
teacher education is really a crowded field now. We have many different kinds of programs, rapid changes. We have lots of new actors. Some are entrepreneurs. Some are charter school founders and leaders. Some are online experts. Some are for-profit providers of all sorts of educational services. We have some programs, as Gloria alluded, that offer very minimal preparation, and they basically assume teachers will learn to teach on the job. Uh, we have some new graduate schools of education that I've been studying that are not affiliated with universities, but they grant master's degrees and they provide certification in teaching. So to me, the challenge here is not to have blanket acceptance or rejection of any of these new uh, directions we have in teacher education, but to try to figure out, are there things in the university that we can learn from any of these alternate new, new approaches? So one example is some of these alternate programs do much better job than some universities in terms of recruiting teacher candidates of color. So is there something universities can learn from them? Um, I think we also need to distinguish constructive disruption, which is a phrase I like, from things that are just meant to disrupt and figure out which things are really innovations and which are um, shortcuts or cheaper approaches that can do damage. A second challenge, I think, is related to what I was talking about this morning, and that is to do the hard work of trying to unpack issues related to inequities in teaching and teacher education. Uh, we need better strategies for recruiting teacher candidates of color, but we also need to transform the cultures of programs and universities that they come into because just recruiting teacher candidates of color is not enough. And many folks leave programs before they finish or they finish and then they never enter teaching. So I think we need to work on that. A third challenge, and this is builds on what Gloria said as well, is I think we need to figure out how to be part of and respond to what people have called the practice turn, which is the idea that more of teacher education should be in the schools, less in the university. Um, I, I don't think that's necessarily the answer. People are saying we need more time in the schools so that people are ready to teach on day one. And you, you've heard that phrase a lot. It's in built into policy many times. But I think we need to unpack what does ready to teach mean? Does it mean teachers who automatically do the same kinds of strategies and techniques for all students all the time? Or does ready to teach mean teachers who deliberately enact principles of practice? So that means what they do looks different for different subjects, different kids, different circumstances. So these two ideas about what ready to teach means make for very different kinds of programs. And I think if universities are going to have a strong future in teacher education, they need to figure out what their definition is. So let me just add to that, having worked as a teacher educator in two states. In California, and if you know the California uh, higher education system, you know it is a three-tiered system. The first tier are community colleges. The second tier are state, California state universities. And the third tier is the University of California system. So the UCLA's, the UC Berkeley's, UC San Diego's. The charge to prepare teachers has been given to the middle tier, to the Cal State system. That's what, because most of them started out as normal schools. So they have the responsibility. For anybody working in the UC system, they must provide the state a justification for why you're having a teacher ed program. So Marilyn talked this morning about UCLA Center X. That became their justification. We're going to do something different. We're going to have the intersection of both teaching and administration that you don't see anywhere. Uh, Berkeley has a, a specific focus. I think at UC Santa Cruz, it's language. In, the, in Wisconsin, it is, again, a state system. 
but it has a flagship, which is Madison. And we've had to justify it. Madison, why do you have a teacher ed program? We've got 14 other campuses that used to be normal schools. Why are you doing teacher ed? And I will really credit my former colleague, Ken Zeitner with saying, where do you think your 14 other schools get their teacher educators? Right. Check the resumes, check the vitas. So we justify having a teacher ed program on the Madison campus because we're the place that helps train teacher educators, but it's a very small program vis-a-vis uh, -vis the size of the university with 42,000 students. And I think that's one of, the, um, one of the tasks that some universities do take on. Teachers College mm -hmm. at Columbia also talks about how they have prepared nearly all of the teacher educators in a tri-state area all around New York City. So I think that's part of the work. Um, one, one last challenge I wanted to mention is in order to have a future is I think we really need to figure out what do universities do that these other places don't do or can't do? What is it that is unique about universities? John Furlong, some of you know his work, he, he once said that the hallmark of universities, what they do better than any other institution is to teach us about the contestability of knowledge. Now, some people will say, well, why in the world do teachers need to know that? But the idea that knowledge is not one truth once and for all, we know this, and all we have to do now is transmit it in teaching or transmit it in teacher education, but that knowledge is always open to question, open to critique, open to new evidence, open to new connections. And I think we want to figure out how we can use that great contribution of universities in preparing teachers. So they don't go out thinking, now I have these four things that I have to do over and over again, but rather I have ways to think about what I'm doing. Of course, you need to know what to do. I'm not saying you don't need to know what to do, but you need to know how to think about and reflect on and inquire about what you're doing so you can do it better or differently. Um, we have a big agenda for the university. Well, don't one, we? <laughs> of the, one of the, the enduring questions that I've had as a teacher educator is what is what are we doing about the intellectual lives of teachers? You know, we can help you with strategy. We can help you with technique. But if you don't spend any time with the life of the mind, and so one of the questions I always ask in an interview in the teacher education uh, missions process is, tell me the last book you read that wasn't assigned to you. I want to know what you're thinking about. And I don't think we give enough attention to our teachers' minds. Yes, and our teachers are some of the best examples we'll put before children mm -hmm. and quite shape, quite strong shaping forces. We're going to turn our, our attention now to promising practices in teaching and teacher education. And Gloria, I wondered if you would start off with your culturally sustaining work on hip hop and spoken word pedagogies, among any other strategies you, you'd like to speak about. So part of my own training is in anthropology. And so culture is a real thing to me. It's not just something that I tag onto a grant application. It's like, it means something. And it is probably the least of the foundational disciplines that we infuse in teaching. We're very, we're heavily psychologized and I'm not bashing my psychology colleagues, followed by sociology but almost nothing in anthropology and really what culture means and specifically the culture of the teacher, not just, oh, I got to learn about these kids' culture. No, we actually have to learn about our own culture and why it determines how we think about things and what we think of as quote, normal versus deviant. So one of the cultures that I've been really immersed in for the last 15 years is youth culture. Uh, I didn't speak of it much in my, first book, I've started, I talk more about it in this third edition, um, because I was working in elementary classrooms and elementary students, while they are consumers of culture are rarely producers of it. But uh, teenagers are 
adolescents are producing culture, everything from fashion to language to ideas. And what I've learned is that that culture is quite generative. Uh, almost no one will make a movie about contemporary life without a hip hop soundtrack. It just, it just really is. Uh, Nabisco sells Oreos to, I showed you, I showed some folks today, to Wiz Khalifa, right? Um, back in 1992, Post Serials did a commercial with the Flintstones with um, Fred and Barney. And Barney is invoking Run DMC with a pork pie hat and gold chain. And for the first time ever, Barney had shoes on his feet. He was wearing Adidas, right? So some where way back in 92, Madison Avenue figured out there's something generative about this. We can actually sell our product if we tap into it. And so the ability to do poetry and to do the arts, um, we see certain films. If you saw the Black Panther and if you watch the Marvel series, they really are quote hip hop uh, movies, if you will. So there's something about this work. I'm very fortunate to have worked at a university that has the only hip hop art scholars program. In other words, we go across the country searching for these young people with this talent and we offer them scholarships in the same way our football coach and our basketball coach and our hockey coaches offer the best in their areas. I've also been really fortunate to be one of the founding uh, panel judges for the National Youth Poet Laureate uh, competition. In fact, I just did my judging last week. It's very hard because these people are fierce. Uh, our first National Youth Laureate was Amanda Gorman. And if you don't recall the name, just think back to the 2020 inauguration because she stood on that podium. So there's something that young people are bringing to us. And, you know, my psychologist friends will tell you prior knowledge matters. Well, these young kids have prior knowledge. We just don't use it very much. And I've been delighted to be able to be engaged in this. Yeah, you always, you wrote about how we need to bring uh, education into culture rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important point that right. you, you make instead of make, impressing kids into education, right? use what they have as their resources. Did, is there another promising practice you'd like to talk about? Um, you know, what I'm, this part of my COVID lessons, and one of the ones that I didn't share with you yesterday is that, you know, school is no longer 8.30 to 2.30 or 9 to 3 or whatever. School can be at any time which means that many of the ancillary services, the so-called after-school programs, and I, I now say there is no after-school, those folks need to be pushing into schools. Let's not wait till three o'clock where kids get out, but how about if some of these folks at the Y or the Boys and Girls Club begin approaching schools and saying, we have resources, we can help. And so, We've been doing that as a part of the Sacramento Area Youth Speaks. I sit on their advisory board. They go into schools and they volunteer their services with in English classes. Help your kids to write poetry. Help your kids to be more uh, confident in language. And in fact, two years ago, the National Youth Poet Laureate was a, one of their students, a, a young woman named, um, oh gosh, uh, Amanda Wynn who is now a student at Stanford, who wrote beautiful poetry and a lot of it talking about what the pandemic had meant to her um, as a student. So I think we are seeing new forms of education. The education is, is becoming much more diffuse and democratic, and it's not just the thing that happens in that building. Some of the more promising practices are happening in community centers and with organizations that Heretofore, we thought of as, oh, that's an after-school activity. Yes, we have the writers in the school, it's in Houston, that they do it during the day and they co-plan with teachers and a wonderful idea. Marilyn, do you have some practices you would like yes. to share with us? Um, it, it's interesting because when we were planning for this session, we were talking about, I think it was Gloria's idea, we should have promising practices at the end because 
the other topics we were talking about with shortages and all the competitors and the work universities haven't done might be depressing. So <laughs> promising practices, and it's very open because you can talk about all sorts of things. So I was gonna mention a few promising practices particularly in teacher education. Yours were, were more about schools and, and teaching. Um, one is what I was talking about this morning. So I won't go into detail, but I think it's very promising the strong equity work in teacher education that is, it's not just beginning, it's been around, but we're seeing more of it. It's not the norm. And I made that really clear this morning. But we are seeing examples of programs that are really including stakeholders. They have people, not just you get a seat at the table, but people are authentically represented. There's recognition of cultural resources and so on. Um, and as I said, I, I a couple of small number of state policies that I think are trying to do strong equity work. So a second promising practice, I wanted to talk about research a little bit since I spend a lot of time doing reviews of research and reading reviews of research. Um, so there's some new research in and on and for teacher education that I think is really quite promising. One is there's a body of work that has to do with teacher identity and teacher agency. And a lot of it is conceptual. Uh, and a lot of it is presenting powerful ideas that I think can really inform our work in teacher education, in particular, sort of an ecological approach to teacher agency, where it's not something that you teach people in a program and then they have it. Now I'm a teacher who has agency. It's something that gets constructed in those working conditions that we were talking about before. So understanding that teacher agency is sort of constructed by the teacher in the context of the work with others. And if we know that in teacher education, I think it changes how we work with uh, teacher candidates and how we think about those things. So a lot of really interesting new work in agency and identity. Um, there's also, interesting new work on technology and teacher education. So we all know that teacher candidates nowadays, all of them are digital natives. So it's not the way it used to be when we were young. Um, when we had people coming into teacher ed programs and part of it was introducing them to computers practically, not that I was doing that work because they were probably introducing it to me, um, but and also helping people deal with their fears or their anxieties about technology. That's not at all what we have today. Now the job and, and the promising work is figuring out how to help teacher candidates understand when, where, why, and how technology can help create new learning opportunities. For, for their students. So I think that work is really promising. There's also work I mentioned this morning, uh, preparing teachers so they can work with kids on critical media literacy skills, which we, I think, desperately need in this country. Um, also, there's interesting work extending and strengthening research that has to do with online teaching and teacher education. So can we do teacher education online? Can we do part of it online? Which parts? What aspects of teacher education might work online? Uh, we certainly have people now who are being prepared completely online. And I think we need some research that asks, so what kind of teachers do those people become? What do they do in their classrooms? What are their, what are their practices? Um, so I think there's a, a variety of work there that's useful. And then a third promising practice will sound very strange, but I think we have research, or I think we have work in teacher education now that goes beyond what I once called teacher education's Bermuda Triangle. Now, so think of a triangle that has three points and I suggested that teacher education's Bermuda Triangle was dichotomy, amnesia, and mythology. But now we have work, I think, that's trying to get beyond those things. So we have promising work that is trying to reject the very not helpful 
dichotomies in teacher education and teaching, the theory practice dichotomy, the school university dichotomy, the researcher practitioner, general education, special education, school leader, school teacher, um, and, and work that is very deliberately linking those ideas and trying to get away from the dichotomies. We have work that's avoiding the trap of amnesia. Now you can guess what that means. Teacher education has a long complex history, but again and again, we have things happen and we have people writing about it or responding to it as if there isn't a long complex history. But I think we now have work that is trying to go beyond that. So one thing that I mentioned a minute ago, the practice turn, that is not a new idea uh, in teacher education. And But we now have people who are saying, wait a minute, this is not new. Here's how it came up before. Here's how it's coming up now. Here's how these are related. And then finally, we have work that is rejecting the persistent mythology that teachers are nothing more than babysitters, especially if they're at the elementary level, or caregivers, and then going a little bit beyond, or behavior managers, or implementers of policy. We have real serious work, I think, that is recognizing teachers as professionals, not just as a word written on paper, but as professionals who know how to build relationships, know how to work with communities, know how to build on students' resources, act as knowledge generators, act as agents of change. And I think this goes probably with our first topic about shortages. If we had more work that went beyond the old mythology about teachers' failings and focused on these things, I think it would help address the teacher shortage problem as well. So maybe that brought us around in a circle a little bit. Yeah, and I, I just like to say this probably will come off as a shameless plug, but I'm not above shameless plugs. Uh, but I've just finished a manuscript on justice. And I've been very deliberate to say, let's not talk about social justice. Let's just talk about justice. Uh, I was a history teacher, a government teacher. The word justice resides in the Constitution. Social justice does not. Justice. And social justice has been allowed to be what I would call justice light. I agree. Okay? So you see it on everybody's website. Oh, we are social justice oriented. I don't even know what that means. But I've really been troubling the term justice. And so if you know we get in a room and have a debate from opposite sides, the spectrums of ideological spectrums, I think we agree that justice is a term that the United States embraces, all right? They have it in writing. Now we can debate what we mean by what constitutes that justice. So I've been really, really, uh, and, and one of the places I've found a lot of, um, support for the notion of justice is actually hip hop. My, my problem right now with this publisher is I can't get away with citing all these folks because you have to pay for them and you have to pay a lot. So trying to cite Common and Nas and um, Yasin Bey or what people know as most deaf, I, I can't get away with it. So I, I had all these wonderful epigraphs and the, and the publisher said, no, we can't, we're not gonna pay for all of that. But I do want to really have us think about what do we mean when we say justice? So I think about some of the horrific things that have happened in the society, the murder of George Floyd, Armand Arbery, Breonna Taylor. Those people did not need social justice. They needed justice. And so when we sort of strip it down to the fundamental concept that is driving the nation, if you will, is that happening in our teacher education? and our teacher preparation. Thank you. And as Dr. Demranda makes his way up here to close this out, I just wanted to add one other similarity between our speakers. I think you can see they are both very evidence-based and they're very even-handed. They're not promoting some orthodoxy or ideology. They take a very balanced look and they have no blinkers on. And they're looking at it. So those years of experience are, are really showing. And thank you so much for being and allowing me to moderate you today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and should I just say that I dye my hair this color so y'all will respect me. <laughs> I'm not really this old. Right.
you know, but I know you respect the gray hair. Me too. All right. With that comment, I'm going to go ahead and say that I had jet black hair at one time too. So that's right. That's right. Wow. Huh? What an impressive dialogue. The fortunes that we enjoy. Please give another round to our speaker and our moderator. Us this afternoon or this early evening. We had um, over 81 people present. So presence still matters, right? Relationships still matter. But we had over 80 visitors online. So well over 160 to 170 visitors attending today. And that is incredibly impressive from not only across the nation, but around the globe internationally. And we are proud at Texas A&M University, but that pride is really covered in the privilege of your presence. And I wanna thank each of you, our moderator, Dr. Cheryl Craig, Dr. Marilyn Cochran-Smith, and Dr. Gloria Ladson-Billings. Thank you once again, personally. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. These types of events not only bring us together, but they serve as an index of our school's culture of excellence and our commitment to preparing future teachers and leaders, the kinds that you heard about today. I wanna to thank each of you, not only for sharing your wisdom, but the privilege of your time, you took time to travel here. And that is so valuable. And we so, so much appreciate it. As a matter of fact, you have an open invitation to visit at any time. <laughs> and we'd love to have you back. Dr. Craig, I wanna also thank you for serving as a moderator this evening. We are proud and privileged as well to have you represent our school. A reminder that to your right, you will find our reception area where you can enjoy some food and beverages and take some time to meet our speakers. Yeah, go up to them, welcome them to Texas A&M like we welcome all who visit our campus. With that, I'd like to once again affirm what a wonderful evening and what a wonderful audience you are. Please join me in a final round of applause for each of our presenters today. And, and why don't we just carry this right over, just go right on over and let's carry this over and say howdy to each other and give a, our guests are not going to be here much longer. Um, it's the middle of the week and they've spent most of the week with us and we also appreciate that. So let, let us take this celebration to be together and let's move over to a wonderful reception. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>